Hello everyone, welcome to this event uh, of the SOAS, Palestine, SOAS Festival of Ideas. Um, I think we are ready to, uh, to begin. In a couple of minutes. So we are very honored today to host um, author Susan Abulhawa and um, academic and um, spoken word artist Rafif uh, Ziada. I'm Ruba Saleh and I'm gonna be in conversation with Susan and uh, I am also an academic um, at the School of Oriental and African Studies uh, at the Department of Anthropology. Um, Susan Abulhawa is often described as one of Palestine's most accomplished and internationally best-selling novelists. Um, Adaf Suaif, another great writer, has described her, her work as uncompromising and unapologetic. Her debut novel, Mornings in Jenin, which was published by Bloomsbury in 2010, translated into 30 languages, is considered a classic in Anglophile Palestinian literature. 
Its reach has made Susan Abul Hawa one of the most, or if not the most widely read Palestinian author. Her second novel, The Blue Between Sky and Water, published in 2015, was likewise an international bestseller. And her last novel, just published um, recently, Against the Loveless World, um, is um, what we're all looking forward to obviously read and talk about tonight. Uh, she's also the author of a poetry collection, My Voice Saw the Wind, which was published in 2013. And she contributes regularly to several uh, outlets, but also anthologies. She's also a political commentator and appears uh, as a frequent speaker. Rafif Ziada is a lecturer in comparative politics of the Middle East at SOAS. Her research interests are broadly concerned with the political economy of war and humanitarianism, racism, and the security state with a particular focus on the Middle East. Rafif's research has appeared on several international peer-reviewed journals. Um, and among her recent publications, I would like to um, mention the co-edited book, Revolutionary Feminisms, which has been just published by Verso. In addition to being an academic, Rafif is a renowned artist and poet. She's the author of the spoken word um, album, Hadil and Shades of Anger and the famous spoken words performances such as We Teach Life, Sir. Angela Davis says of Rafif, the words that she says with such beauty and grace hit you right in the heart. They are more powerful than any weapon. So we're really lucky tonight to have two incredibly um, powerful um, authors, artists um, to join us in a conversation. Um, the evening will, uh, will go as follow. Um, I will um, ask questions um, to Susan, so we'll engage in a conversation. And after Rafif will read um, some um, excerpts from um, um, Susan's books. Um, and we will then offer Susan uh, the opportunity to, um, to reply. Uh, at the end, um, we will be collecting comments and questions for Susan on the Q&A uh, function of Zoom. And so I would like to invite uh, the audience to please um, type in your questions and we will then pose them at the end of the first part of the evening to, um, to Susan. And obviously if there are questions to Rafi, uh, these are also welcome. So thank you very much. Um, Susan, one of the most extraordinary aspects of your writing in my view is how you make the history of Palestinian displacement be the springboard for reflections of, on the human and the human condition. Your novels are about exile, they're about death, the violent loss of Palestine. They're stories of Palestine told from the vantage point of the exiled. They're stories of families struggling to rebuild their lives, their world after destruction and dispossession. But they're also, and most intensely, intimate portrayals of relationships, of feminist resistance to patriarchy, as well as their stories of survival from trauma, from abandonment, from rape, from abuse. Their stories of survival or survivance. Their stories of friendships, um, of gossips, of humor, of spirituality and more. You say at page 193 of Mornings in Janine, one of my favorite um, of your work, the Israeli occupation exposes us very young to the extremes of our own emotions until we cannot feel except in the extreme. So these are you know, universal themes uh, on which we as Palestinians have a lot to say. Um, my question to you is, do you see your novels as functionally, functioning not only as masterful pieces of art, but also as ways of processing um, the individual and collective traumas that as Palestinians we have been subject to? Are they also ways to give words to the unspoken sides of, and the unspeakable sides of our history? Rafif. Susan, are you trying to speak? Because you are on mute. I will mute my. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I was. Uh, I was just saying thank you, Ruba, and um, uh, it's it's a it's a joy to be with uh, two Palestinian sisters in this talk. Um, I uh, yes, my novels are. Um, set to a backdrop of our collective trauma. Um, as a matter of fact, I think that most, most 
writers who come from marginalized societies um, or oppressed communities often write from the collective wound that, that binds us. And for Palestinians, that collective wound is, um, uh, uh, is not just historic, it's ongoing. And it is, it's the thing that, um, it's, the, it's the place, it's the landscape where we all meet, regardless of our background, regardless of our geographic fra fragmentation, our political outlook, our um, uh, uh, economic um, situation. Uh, this is, you know, this reality of exile and displacement and um, erasure is, is the springboard upon which, or the scaffolding upon which all of our lives exist, um, regardless of who we are and where we are in the world. And so naturally, if I'm writing a story about Palestinians, um, this, this landscape, um, this political, spiritual, uh, cultural landscape that, that binds us is going to be, um, is going to be the backdrop of, of all of my stories, no matter what the story is. Um, but the truth is when I write, um, I have, I kind of have a one track mind uh, and it's, it's, it's a singular loyalty to the characters um, and nobody else, <laughs> nothing else. Not, I, I don't think of the, the readers um, I don't think of the publisher, the, the, the potential reviews, um, the money, uh, uh, anything really. I, I try to keep a one track mind always to, um, to, faith, to be faithful to the characters and to their story. And um, so, yeah, that's, and that was especially true with my first two books. Um, it was a little bit harder uh, with the new novel um, because there are uh, there are a lot of themes in this book um, that I felt were going to be replete with Orientalist traps that I was a bit terrified of falling into. And um, so on the one hand, um, I, I do, I try to write without, um, without you know, giving any consideration to how it's going to be received and whatnot. But I also, with this book, I felt this kind of orient, this um, Western gaze, uh, because I'm, because I'm writing in English. Like if I were writing in Arabic as a first language, this wouldn't even be a consideration. But because I'm writing in English and I'm writing about, um, th about, uh, about. Pretty intense sexual abuse and prostitution and um, and patriarchy and how that how that translates in the lives uh, of of a multitude of characters. I I was keenly aware of this Orientalist uh, gaze and um, and so that so that this so this book was an exception to that rule. But I nonetheless really tried to to remain faithful uh, to the characters no matter what. Thank you so much. Um, so one of the pieces I chose in this conversation was the, uh, from the book, The Blue Between Sky and Water, um, to talk about the multiple exiles. And sometimes we think of exile as a singular movement, but if you're a Palestinian refugee, you realize it's much more complicated and many families are actually scattered over multiple exiles and multiple generations. So this is uh, the chapter title 15. Suddenly homeless refugees after Israel took everything, Palestinians were ripped from both, were ripe for both pity and exploitation throughout the Arab world, where the brightest Palestinian minds bore fruit for other nations and once proud farmers chased the call of bread, becoming desperate workers far from their lands. My great Khalo Mamdouh was swept up in that stream of cheap labor that kept carrying him further and further away. In Cairo, Mamdouh worked without respite. He lived in a dormitory with other Palestinian laborers. Every day, he awoke to the call of the Adhan, beckoning the faithful to prayer, and performed the morning salat before heading to his job. And at the end of the day, he would muster the energy for a cup of tea 
and a light dinner with his comrades before collapsing into bed. Sometimes he stayed awake to count his money, which he kept in a small purse strapped to his body at all times until he could deliver his earnings to Yasmin for safekeeping. He took two days off each month to travel back to Gaza, where the beekeeper's widow Yasmin and Nazmiya would have spent the previous day planning and preparing his favorite foods. They would be waiting for him with water, warming over a flame so he could have a proper bath, the only one he could get each month because only cold water came out of the dormitory cap. A simple cotton dishdashe would have been washed and kissed by the sun on the lines for him. And when he finally arrived by taxi or rickshaw, the three women of his heart would wrap him with kisses and blessings. Each time he brought them small gifts and tales from Cairo. On one such vis visit, he spoke of news from Kuwait where oil was pushing up new cities and industries and a new society of entitled Bedouins was paying Palestinians to do everything from building and staffing their hospitals and schools to cooking their meals and wiping their asses. Several of his Palestinian comrades in Cairo had already moved to Kuwait and spoke fondly of the desert. I was thinking maybe we could all go there, he suggested, even though he knew his sister Nazmiya would never leave Palestine and he wasn't sure his Yasmin would either. The beekeeper's widow, on the other hand, was ready to soar wherever the wind would take her, except to desert soil, where food could not grow from the ground, and Kuwait was mere, merely a desert by the sea. Nazmiya was in her fifth pregnancy, fifth pregnancy when Mamdouh and Yasmin moved to Kuwait, before they left Nazmiya, held her brother's face, then Yasmin's. She kissed them with tearing eyes and repeated the words that Maryam had deposited in her being, we will always be together. Thank you. Um, so, um, your book, your books are stories of displacement, as we said, and Rafif beautifully um, brought us in in that atmosphere. But exile doesn't always take center stage. It, it rather represents what I see as a background, the eventful against which ordinary and extraordinary stories of loss, of love, of reconstruction, and their powerful characters come alive. So there's love, there's care, there's compassion. And these are the recurrent themes running through the, these incredible female figures, and not only female figures, all, all, also very poetically drawn male figures in your novels. There is a revolutionary love, but there is also love that challenges, uh, and there is love that challenges gender norms, but also there is the calm and less, no less powerful love of traditional relationships. Um, the love for the revolution runs through, um, and it is not, it is there, it is not obscured, but it's often embodied in the political intensity of mother's and lover's love. Um, so you give us not the nationalist romanticized love for the homeland that we are so used to um, read about, but you give us what I would say love for home, the nature, the food, the smell, the scent um, of different homes that constitute in the memory and the reality of, of, of these figures, um, a precarious but, but powerful home. Um, so, and this home is reproduced in your novels across, mainly across and through relationships in the camp, uh, in the gharb, in the exile or elsewhere. There is affection for the refugee camp, for example, in Gaza or in Beirut, which becomes also home, albeit again, a very precarious one. And these places in your novel become home thanks to the work of love and the relationship that this love produces. And love is also directly proportional to grief in intensity. There is one moment where you make Fatima say to Amal in Mornings in Janine, something that stayed with me for a long time in, at page 193. Our sadness can make the stones weep and the way we love is no exception. So this is a love that commences where grief leaves and melts into spirituality. And I see love in your novels as a social and spiritual muscle so I wanted to ask you if, do you think that love, and obviously the title of your last novel, which is a very powerful and evocative title against the loveless world, does love provide a new framework for thinking about home and about existing in the world? 
Um, first of all, thank you for um, for recognizing the the pervasive element of love um, in my books um, because you know from my point of view they are love stories. I think people tend to to see my work as um, uh, uh, far more political um, and and it's because I'm Palestinian and because I write about um, stories where the characters have to navigate a tumultuous political reality. Um, but at the heart of it is, uh, uh, is love. Um, love of the land, uh, the love between friends, the love between uh, a farmer and, uh, and his harvest and his animals, a love between a love for books, a love for history, a love for our ancestors, um, a, a deep uh, love from which hope and resistance springs. Um, I think Che Guevara uh, is the one who once said that, you know, at the very core of, of revolution is this um, very deep uh, love. And, and I believe that. Um, I do, um, I also, uh, as, you, as you hinted at, really kind of, I, I reject this notion of, um, of a romanticized homeland. I think very often uh, we, so one of the things, so like in popular imagination, at least in the West and, and actually increasingly also in the Arab world, Palestinians are, are portrayed as this dichotomy of either we are uh, these mad, irrational, um, hateful, violent people, or we are these um, pitiable, uh, profoundly um, enduring, <laughs> uh, you know, that's the Samud discourse that we can take anything um, with these pitiable uh, refugees, um, objects of charity and, and whatnot. And of course, we know as Palestinians that our society spans the full spectrum of humanity from, uh, from the most noble individuals to the most corrupt. And, you know, what I think both of these narratives, um, whether it's from the left or the right, are, are equally dangerous. They are equally dehumanizing, equally um, dismissing of our humanity, of the depth of our, uh, uh, of our, of our culture and our, um, of our, and our society. And sometimes, it, and also what arises from this dichotomous discourse is that the minute there is something to contradict this romanticized view of Palestinians, um, then, you know, there is this, oh, well, you know, <laughs> you're not who I thought you were. Maybe you're not as deserving of liberty. Um, I mean, there, there's this kind of reaction, right? So, the, so the, the, the conversation becomes Palestinians deserve human rights because they're so good and because they are, um, they have this enduring Um uh, So all of these, you know, all of this kind of discourse is, ends up, making cartoons of our lives. And this is why art and literature um, are so powerful uh, in, as, as, as corrective um, measures in that um, it's, really, it's only really through art and literature and film and music and, so, and song and dance um, and food that that the full expression of our humanity can find space. Um, and it is, I think, the mandate of, of the artist to carve out a space wherever we are in this, in, in whatever, whatever artistic landscape we stand on, whether it's poetry or literature or whatnot. Um, you know, one of the things that um, that inspired me to write in the first place uh, was Edward Said 
lamenting that there were so few Palestinian novels in, in the English language. Um, and, uh, you know, when I, it was only when I heard him say that, that I realized that I've never really read myself reflected in anything that I, that I'd ever read. Um, I'd never seen any, anything that resembled my life and the literature that I had, um, grown up on, even in the Middle East, even, you know, I didn't grow up entirely in the United States. I was, you know, I grew up in Kuwait for uh, most of my childhood and I lived in Jerusalem for a large part of my childhood. Um, and even there, like the, the literature that we consumed um, did not reflect us. So, um, and, and in general, not just for Palestinians, I mean, if you look at any society in the world, when you think of that society, the face of that society is their culture. It's what they wear, it's how they dance, it's their music, it's the books they, they produce, um, the films they produce, the art they produce. So, and we are no exception, um, but what makes Palestinian literature and Palestinian art so much more urgent is that we, our existence is literally being denied. And, um, and so when we create, uh, whatever we create, we are, we are affirming our existence in the world, not just for others to see, but for our children. Um, you know, even though I don't really write for an audience and my major, um, my only loyalty is to the characters, because my only loyalty is to the characters, um, by default, the, my most important audience is um, Palestinians or Palestinians, especially young Palestinians. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Um, so uh, the next passage I picked was from Against This Loveless World. And if people haven't had a chance to pick up the book yet, please, please do. Um, I think it's, it's exceptional. Um, but the piece I'm going to read is the wedding piece where you describe the thobe. And it, it was just so beautiful. I felt like I could see the thobe in front of me. So I just wanted to read a little bit from that. Um, a little more than four months after Hajj Imam Muhammad passed away, Bilal and I got mar married in a memorable Falahi wedding. We had wanted only a small celebration with family and friends. In part, it was all we could afford, but mostly it didn't seem proper to have a wedding at the time. The second Intifada was in its second year and Israelis had just elected Ariel Sharon, the butcher of Beirut as prime minister, and his brutal legacy was already being felt. But my mother and Bilal's aunts would have none of that. Exactly the opposite. We show those monsters how we will continue to live and love on our land, no matter what they do to us, Ghassan said to Bilal. Mama Jihad and Sitte Wasfiya made the journey from Jordan. I agreed to get a visa from the sons of Satan at their godforsaken embassy just for you, Sitte said. Your mother tried to make me miss the wedding on account of the doctor claiming my heart is too weak, but my heart feels fine. Then she turned to Bilal, Nahir's mother gets jealous because my son's children love me more than they love her. You're a good man for marrying my granddaughter, even though she was married before and couldn't keep her husband very long. He already knows it, I assure you. Muhammad is his brother, remember? Yeah, that's right, she said, I forgot. She turned again to Bilal, nothing is the same without her. I wish we were all still in Kuwait with my son. Or how about if we could all be here forever again? She wiped tears away with her hijab. Mama consoled her. Siti was losing her mind, and these reveries happened often, Mama had told me. Mama had been trying to pull me away all day. When I finally had a moment, she made me close my eyes and guided me into the guest bedroom. Open your eyes, she said. What I saw took my breath away. I flung my arms around my mother's neck and began sobbing, Habibti, Mama. May God keep you always. May he extend your life and presence in mind for all our days. This is the best present I have received from anyone ever. Thank you. Laid out on the bed was a stunning, elegant, embroidered wedding thobe and an equally striking headpiece. Come, let's try it on, she said. As I moved to pick up, Mama explained her creation. 
I thought a lot about this and decided to use the basic patterns of the Jerusalem taupe because we're being erased from her story and her stone, she said. Even the way she described her embroidery was poetic. Ordinarily, I would use white silk for this though, but I found this gorgeous terracotta silk that harkens to Jericho. You see here on the chest piece, this is a collar worn by Canaanite queens. I added these geometric patterns typical of the Romy thobes from the Ramallah area to show the olive, almond, and pomegranate trees. On the sides here is the crucifixion from when the crusaders ruled over us. And here you see is the crescent for the return of Jerusalem to Muslim rule since the time of Salah al-Din. I was in awe. This is a treasure, Mama. You're the treasure, she said. And here, look closely at these shapes. Verse 21 from Surah al-Rum in the Quran, a prayer for marriage. It was hard to make out the convoluted script, but Mama read it to me. And of his wisdom is that he created for you from yourselves mates that may find tranquility in them. And he placed between you affection and mercy. Indeed, for in these are wisdoms of those who think. I ran my fingers over the intricate stitches of terracotta, emerald, maroon, and apricot. Life was seeping, life was sweeping me up in an unexpected dream. Really beautiful. Yeah, I was also very, very um, fixed on that passage of the Thorb because it's like it encompasses um, all kinds of emotions and colors and memories and knowledge, uh, marking a certain type of belonging, indigeneity uh, that is passing from one generation to the next. And I, I thought it was really, really a, a masterpiece. Uh, but uh, I wanted to um, bring you back to exile and um, reflect on another theme uh, that uh, is very recurrent across all of your novels. Um, and this is, I think, the fact that what, what I really find um, very powerful, and, and not only because I identify like myself, I, I identify like myself, I think, um, all of the Palestinians who are scattered across uh, multiple dimensions of exile. The exile you talk about and you narrate so powerfully is not just the original exile, the exile propelled by 1948 uh, with the catastrophe and the Nakba, but it's also the exile of migration, of diaspora, of, of, uh, of feeling um, exiled from one's culture, from one's own language, from one's own self, um, which we see very, very uh, powerfully in, in, in figures like Amal, in Morning in Janine, but also uh, Mamdouh uh, and Noor, most notably, uh, in, in the blue between the sky and the water. Um, and I think what, what you really uh, do in a very remarkable way is to bring together, to interwave the, the political, the cultural, and the psychological dimensions of exile, which intertwine in all of your characters, so, so to speak. Uh, but what, what of the most powerful part for me was um, the way in which kind of you describe the the um, the way in which, for example, um, Amal um, arriving um, at Philadelphia Airport finds herself, and and I, I'm quoting you, 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 the book here in, in Amal's words, as an unclassified Arab Western hybrid, uprooted and unknown. So exiled here is is um, very clearly um, transposed into an idea of a, another form of uprootedness that, that comes with migration. Uh, but also exile is transposing the story of Noor, which is a very, very painful story of, of individual uh, trauma, abandonment, uh, of rape, of abuse, of, and of searching again for love, for home, and for recognition. But exile and return are also, however, the moments in which these protagonists reflect on their past and and on particularly on the beauty of, of, of Arabic language, which I think is masterfully presented in passages of mornings in Janine, for example, in page uh, one, uh, 169, when again, um, Amal arriving uh, at Philadelphia airport and uttering the words, thank you to the host who has come to pick her up, realizes how in Arabic gratitude, as you say, is a language unto itself. May Allah bless the hands that give me this gift. Beauty is in your eyes that find me pretty. And then again, arriving and returning to Beirut in August on a warm day at page 185, Amal again finds her language. And she says, 
the guttural silk tones of Arabic rippled through me as I heard the melodic calls and responses of my language. And she defines it as a dance. So my question is, what is the dance that happens in your pen between Arabic and English? <laughs> and do you feel as a Palestinian American author that your writing is a syn synthesis of two identities and melodies? Or do you still feel you belong to a space of exile that shape your writing and artistic sensibility? Um, thank you for that question. Um, that's um, uh, it's very astute of you to, to connect those things. Um, so a lot of, you know, a lot of the, the uh, sometimes I think as authors, we put a little bit of ourselves <laughs> in the characters. And a lot of these experiences that Amal um, went through are, are things that uh, I myself have felt at different times. Um, I, you know, I write in English because, um, because exile has quite literally stolen Arabic from me. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm literate in Arabic. I speak it fluently, um, but I have, I don't have the level of sophistication um, required to write a novel and to fully, you know, express myself creatively. But when I'm writing, I'm thinking in Arabic. I mean, I'm inhabiting this world where everybody speaks Arabic, where um, uh, where the geography is is the the familiar landscape of. Uh, 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 of, of Palestine, of Lebanon, um, and the other countries in my books. Um, but what comes out of my, you know, of my pen or my, my, my keyboard um, are, is in English. And I think that influences the, the way that I write in English. I've been told more actually as a criticism by, uh, by Anglophile critics um, or Western critics in general, not just in English, um, also in the translations, that uh, sometimes I write a little bit too flowery, or you know, they, they've criticized the lack of um, economy and uh, in my prose, which is you know something that is typical of of Arabic uh, literature, um, which tends to be you know a little bit more. Uh, texturized, you know, um, I mean, Arabic language is, is very poetically charged. And um, so I think, you know, thinking that way in Arabic, I, it, it, it tends to come out in my writing in English. Um, the, the, you know, on the issue of uh, the, the calls and responses, I, you know, when, when I was a kid, the kind of that kind of stuff used to annoy me. You know, in Arabic we call it mujamalat. You know, you're trying to trying to get leave somebody's house, and it takes like an hour. You know, to <laughs> because of, because there's all this. You know, there's it's beautiful. You know, I mean, and 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 I think it's you know it's annoying to you when you're a kid because you don't really have you have to become an adult and or or, or somebody who appreciates language to. To, to realize how, how rich and resonant uh, and, and beautiful it is. And to come from such a culture where, you know, people trip over themselves in this infinite language of gratitude. I mean, really, there's no, there's no limits to the way you can say thank you. You know, I mean, there's, it's endless and it's all prayer for, prayerful appreciation. And so to come from that world and to think in that way, to have nothing in English except thank you, it jams you up a little bit. Um, and and I've so so what I end up doing sometimes in English is I'll say thank you, <laughs> you know, like really emphasize it because I that's all I have are, are those two words. No, really, really, thank you. Um, so that you know that's um, that's one of the beauties of Arabic, and I think it's important. Um, even if we do, as, as Arab writers write in English, it's important for that to be present um, in, in literature, because if you, you know, you're, you're reflecting people's lives, the characters' lives, and you can't translate 
a person's life um, or a character's life, no matter what language you're speaking in. And so, so one of the one of the challenges um, for for Arab writers who write in non-Arabic languages is to is to represent a culture linguistically um, uh, in in another language that is not entirely compatible with with the language that your characters are speaking. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't have any hard rules on how that's done. It's kind of on a sentence by sentence basis <laughs> or paragraph by paragraph basis. Uh, but it has to be done, and I think it's important to be mindful of that. To, um, yeah, to 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 bring the character's language into a prose that's not their language, and sometimes that means not translating certain Arabic words. And so, in all of my books, um, there's they're peppered with a lot of Arabic words and Arabic sayings and and phrases because it, it doesn't, it feels wrong to pervert the, those phrases in a translation because like when we say inshallah, right? Yes, there's a translation, right? God willing. But when you, when you come from a culture that, that says inshallah, you understand how big that word is, how, how, how silly it can be, how annoying, how wonderful. I mean, it has so many different connotations. And when you translate it into English to God willing, it just, it loses, it loses everything. It loses its texture, its sound, its history, the, the grandmothers, the mamas saying it. And um, it loses all of that and it becomes bare and, and it's, so it feels wrong to translate it. So I keep it in Arabic and then I just put a glossary at the end. Yeah. Or my publishers make me put a glossary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we saw in Against the Loveless World, there was a war wonderful glossary <laughs> at the beginning. You know, I didn't have a, a glossary at first, and that was something my, the publishers wanted me to do. And I didn't realize how many Arabic words there were in this, or phrases there were, until I had to pull them out. And I was like, oh my god, <laughs> I think there were like, I don't know, almost a hundred or something crazy. Um, yes. But yeah. It's, it's so interesting to hear you say that about the language. Um, I remember I learned English much later in life and I remember my high school English teacher taking my essays and writing flowery, flowery, flowery all across them, wanting me to like change how I wrote. So I think it's something we all go through. Um, th the piece I wanted to read next was from Warnings in Janine and exactly this moment we're speaking about uh, where she arrives in Philadelphia. Nine o'clock on the morning of May 16, 1982, 26 hours after I left Beirut, I was in Philadelphia with a cheerless void of not wanting to be there. It seemed a lifetime and passed, had passed since I had first come to that city, unsure of my step, frightened that an escalator would drag me under, jealous of, of Lisa Hadid's hair. Immediate tasks in hand, I called Dr. Muhammad Maher, Majid's former mentor in England, settled now in Philadelphia professorship. Amal, I have been expecting your call, he said in a voice husky with age and cheer. Please wait for me in the baggage claim. I'll be there in less than 30 minutes. And known to me, Majid had been corresponding with Dr. Maher for months, making arrangements. Already I had employment. I was to prepare clinical trial reports for federal audits. The pay is good. I'll just need to show them proof of your degree. If you decide for something else, I'll also help you. Majid was like a son to him. So please, I would love it if you call me Ammo or just Muhammad if you'd rather, but none of this doctor business. Touched and without adequate words, thank you, conveying a dearth of gratitude. In Arabic, I said, Allah keep you in grace and bounty of goodness upon you. This kindness of yours, doctor, Ammo, I mean, is humbling. Life was quickened here. I had forgotten that within two weeks, I had been trained on the job visited an obstetrician and gone five times to the immigration office. My husband was cleared to come to the United States, but a response for Fatima's visa would require at least another month. With rows, rows of taunt African braids and a kind smile, the INS lady said, I know it's a mess over there. I'll do all I can to push it through. Thank you. May Allah smile on you with, plenty, with plentitude and love. The city seemed to have changed while I was away. 
West Philadelphia had become a uh, drug infused poverty. I saw despair now where the authority had been in the faces of the heavy matriarchs still passing the days in the shade of habit on their porches. Old friends, Angela Haddad, Bobo and Jimmy. It's nice to see you again, Amal. An apartment in the northeastern part of the city wanting to avoid becoming a burden on the Mahes. While I waited to receive my family, biding, biding time with hope and sporadic telephone conversations with my husband or Fatma, Ammu Muhammad and his wife Elizabeth fashioned themselves into a surrogate family. Ammu and Elizabeth had married nearly 50 years. They had served as healers, a physician and she a nurse, living on the small salaries of aid organizations in the plains of Africa after leaving Oxford. Now in the United States, with the grand compensation of North Americans, their lives had an air of restlessness, of want for children. Though their bodies carried their 70 odd years well, age had eroded bones and carried off a vigor, forcing them to slow their pace where they could recruit young medical skill to carry on the legacy of their work. Medicine without borders, a labor of love, but not enough. My arrival with life swelling in my abdomen steered the sediments of their advanced years, latent and undeniable, the instinctive affinity of the old for babies and children delighted them now, and they protected my swollen state. Beautiful. Thank you, Rafif. Susan, I want to ask you about something. Uh, I'm trying here to kind of ask you questions that I hope nobody has ever asked you <laughs> to give you an opportunity um, to, um, or maybe to give us an opportunity to hear you saying, um, maybe discovering things uh, through our questions that uh, weren't uh, discovered before. I, I'm very, very intrigued by the way in which nature pops out in, your, in all your novels. Um, and nature in, in, uh, across, I would say, the three books, but uh, perhaps most um, pervasively in, uh, in the second one, um, is an omnipresent character. <laughs> Uh, there is this constant intermingling between the human and the post-human in the novels where uh, nature is not just the background or the framework in which events unfold, but it is really uh, part of the way in which the, the, fem the female and the male characters uh, uh, feel and think and live. Um, in particular, um, I think um, the way in which you describe, for example, <clears throat> not only the harvest in pre-1948, in, in notably in Mornings in Janine, which, which is very beautifully and poetically presented. I mean, we are introduced to the, to the story uh, in Mornings in Janine through this beautiful picture of the olive harvest. Um, but aside from olives, which are like a constant trope of Palestinian literature, there are all kinds of meals or, or kinds of uh, natural um, um, descriptions and all kinds of um, uh, attachments to this um, to these natural words. There is also the presence of the smell of the scents that is constantly um, reproduced across the novels and that uh, um, features in, in in the conversations, in in the settings, in the in the emotions, in the identities of the protagonists, and even in the names because the, the protagonist of your last book, uh, Against the Loveless World, is Naher, is River. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you whether this is intentional and um, whether it aims at marking a kind of indigeneity of the Palestinians to, not only to their land, but to the memories of, the, of this land, or to the ways in which this um, sense of Palestine as, as home is reproduced also elsewhere. Yeah, oh, it's absolutely intentional. Um, I think that, uh, you know, um, most indigenous societies, especially, um, especially those who live off the land and certainly, you know, Fallahin belong in that category. And I come from a long line of Fallahin um, in the Jerusalem district of Palestine. Um, they there is a there is a, a a reverence for the natural world i mean for example you know palestinian attachment to olive trees is not just um i mean it's a spiritual attachment uh, uh you know you see 
farmers weep as if they had lost a family member when these settlers, uh, you know, come and burn down their trees. And they, they and they do they cut down our trees because they understand how important they are to us, not just economically. To to think that this is an economic issue would be to misunderstand Palestinians completely. Um, there is there 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 is a, a soul connection between individuals. Um, and, and their land and their trees and their animals, um, as there is a connection with us collectively to, uh, to the trees and the hills. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, I think humans everywhere have become uh, very disconnected from the natural world. And even in social justice struggles, there is there's never uh, there is rarely a, a an analysis of of the physical space in which we conduct our struggles. Um, and you know this is a this is a conversation that I have with my comrades and socialist and, and Marxist organizations all the time, um, which is you know our predecessors had always sort of taken for granted that this, you know, this earth was um, endlessly bountiful and, uh, and, and immutable and it's just always gonna be there. And, you know, of course we know that's not true. Um, and we are living in an era where, you know, actually our, our home, our planet is, is burning, you know, it's, it's dying and withering under our thumb. Um, so I think, I think every sto stories cannot be disconnected from the natural world, um, at least not in my mind. I mean, I'm, um, my nature as a, as a, as a, as a person is, is very much an introvert and a loner. And I, I spend a lot of time with my animals, my dogs, especially um, in the woods. I, I am, or, or by the beach. Uh, I garden, you know, I plant my, my, most of my produce now, you know, comes from my garden. Um, and there's, I think, you know, sort of reviving this connection. I mean, actually in doing that here, there's, um, there's kind of a, it feels, you know, it's maybe sounds silly to some people, but it feels like a connection with my ancestors. You know, the condition of exile is, it, it pilfers your heart, it pilfers your soul in ways that you don't even recognize until, you know, you're much older and you realize, wow, I've, you know, I've lost, I've lost something profound. And, you know, sort of this reconnection with, with soil, with dirt um, is part of, you know, tying those loose ends, you know, back together, however you can. Um, and as an artist, as a writer, it, it that's always going to be reflected in, in what I, what I write and, and how I write. Um, I'm also, you know, I despair uh, about the condition of our planet and in particular about the, 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 the state of wildlife, the, the harrowing exploitation of, of animals, um, not just, you know, for meat and dairy consumption, uh, but, you know, for experimentation and, and, and entertainment, you know, um, these are, these are things that, that cause me, um, really a lot of great, um, despair as much as as much as you know seeing what is becoming of our of our society of our country of our people um so you know all i know how to do is to write and to organize and so that's where i deposit um that's where i deposit these you know the things that are inside of me um when it comes to that so um yeah, and along those lines, you know, I am vegan um, for those reasons. And I think, you know, 
advocating and caring about the liberation of animals um, and the protection of, of nature and the protection of wildlife is wholly consistent with um, our struggle for liberation as Palestinians. Absolutely. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Rafif. I'm very glad on that note to be reading from uh, Mornings and Janine again, the harvest scene, because I think oh. it captures that so well. Um, and it's from- We didn't plan this, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and it's from 1941, that's how it starts, which I think has its own beauty as well. In a distant time, before history marched over the hills and shattered present and future, before wind grabbed the land at one corner and shook it of its name and character, before Amal was born, a small village east of Haifa lived quietly on figs and olives, open frontiers and sunshine. It was still dark, only babies sleeping, when the villagers of Ain Hod prepared to perform the morning salat, the first of five daily prayers. The moon hung low, like a buckle, of, like a buckle fastening earth and sky just a sliver of promise shy of being full. Waking limbs stretched, water splashed away sleep, hopeful eyes widened. Wudu, the ritual cleansing before Salat, sent murmurs of the Shahada into the morning fog as hundreds of whispers proclaimed the oneness of Allah and service to his prophet Muhammad. Today they prayed outdoors and with particular reverence because it was the start of the olive harvest best to climb the rocky hills with a clean conscience on as much on to such an important occasion. Thus and so, by the pre-dawn orchestra of small lives, crickets and steering birds, and soon roosters, the villagers cast moon shadows from their prayer rugs, most simply asked forgiveness of their sins. Some prayed an extra rak'ah in one way or another, each said, my Lord Allah, let your will be done on this day. My submission and gratitude is yours. Before setting off westward towards the groves, stepping high to avoid the snags of cactus. Every November, the harvest week brought renewed vigor to Ain Hod, and Yahya Abu Hassan could feel it in his bones. He left the house early with his boys, coaxing them with his annual hope of getting a head start on the neighbors. But the neighbors had similar ideas and the harvest always began around 5 a.m. Um, the harvest in Palestine is going to start soon, so good luck to all our families back home. Brilliant. <laughs> um, thank you, Rafif. That was really nice. Um, yes, I agree. And I think it, the harvest has already started to, in some places. It's uh, um, I've been seeing some videos, and it... it uh, it just makes me homesick. It makes, you know. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to say actually to 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 add one more sentence on nature that, but I don't want to spoil the the end of the against the loveless world for those who haven't read it. But I wanted to stress that uh, trees and stones, <laughs> um, basically, are among the things that offer reasons for hope at the end of the book, <laughs> and they are part and parcel of the joy that uh, um, Bilal and Naher are maybe finally reunited through an invitation to meet under a tree. But we will not go more than that, further than that into telling what happens. Um, so I wanted to um, take you to another feature of your books that I found very, very interesting, very intriguing, very uh, powerful in many ways, which is the issue of how colors um, feature across your novels, uh, particularly through your female characters. Um, and um, obviously the most important is Alwan, who I mean, one of the most important uh, characters of, of, your second no of your second novel, who is um, named Alwan, which is the Arabic um, mm -hmm. um, noun for colors. Uh, and obviously there is the color Emphasis on blackness uh, in Mornings in Janine, exactly when I'm Kim and her accent, obviously. But I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, you broke out for most of that. I, I was trying to text you. Okay. 
I, I, the, the last thing I heard was um, your mention of Alwan. Yeah, so you, 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 you obviously have um, a constant reference to colors, both as skin colors and the way in which identity comes. And describing her foreignness appear. But obviously, um, also in the different relationships she establishes with the white, what she describes as the white world and the black community around her. And then, of course, there is Alwan, who is the color and colorful um, character par excellence, not only. Uh, not least because of her name, which in Arabic uh, means uh, Alwan, is colors, which is a magical figure. I, I, I don't know if you can hear you me. Have, no. Am I still breaking? No, yeah, I just, uh, I last thing I heard was magical. Um, and then it's just very short. What was the last thing you said? Yeah. Um, so I was referring to Miriam and Noor, who see colors and associate them with emotions. Uh -huh. um, and so, as you say, there is this deliberate appending of what these colors means in the novel. And I wanted to ask you about that. You know, what, what is it about colors and what does what does it mean to use color as both a metaphor and an experience of, of the self? So. Um you know you earlier you said you wanted to ask me something no one has ever asked before so this is one of the things and, and right. remarkably you know no <laughs> one's ever really picked up on that and I, I thought they would but actually in all of my books i really i try to challenge this sort of notion of of colors because because so much of our world at least in the united states is built and but also in in the Arab world as well is built around um, race and skin color. Um, standards of beauty have everything to do with the tone of your skin. And we have all linguistically, we, we categorize black in, in, the, in the most sinister descriptions um, and white as in the most ethereal, you know, it's, it's almost, it's, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not a linguist. Um, and I, so I don't know the origin of these, I don't know the origin of these phrases that, that make black so ominous and um, uh, in, in language, um, you know, like, you know, all of these things, um, all these sayings that we have in Arabic that denote darkness as something awful and ugly um and we take for granted that that's you know uh i think people never even think about it you know never even think about where this where these ideas come from or why um and how they influence the way we see the world so i so these were you know the use of colors was a deliberate attempt to kind of upend uh upend these assumptions um uh, the Noor and Maryam uh, in, in the Blue Between Sky and Water both can see, uh, can see colors. Um, and it, it's, uh, they call it seeing colors. I mean, we all see colors, but they, they see emotions in terms of color. And so they, they, have, a, they have a perception that most of us don't. Um, and actually this is a condition it's a biological condition called synesthesia, where people's senses get crossed so that people can see music or hear color um, and, and things like that. So, so you know, the, the wires get crossed in, in their brain somehow. And Noor and Maryam can have, can sense emotions in terms of color around people. Um, and the way they describe in the book is that white, whiteness is the most sinister of all <laughs> um which is you know diametrically opposed to what we think of white as being you know this the color of angels or the color of goodness and whatnot or um and and in their view black is the purest of all it's the color of babies it's the color of um of good intentions and and kind-heartedness and um in 
in Mornings in Janine, likewise, you know, the character when she comes to the United States, she she is always met with um, suspicion and or or you know this kind of uh, uh, curiosity about the other um, from the white world, and she never really finds a place as a person, as a friend. Um, but it's it's not that way in in black communities, uh, and this was my experience also in the United States. Um, so I, I sort of reflected that in uh, um, in Amal's life when she comes to the United States, um, where she finds more of a home uh, um, in the black community among black families, and she finds friendships based on um, on individual interactions um, that you know that don't presuppose she is an other or or um, or something to uh, something less than or, or, or anything like that. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Uh, I would have so many questions about the issue of colors and uh, it, it leads to so many other possible ideas and questions and intriguing aspects, but I want to leave uh, the floor to Rafif. Sure, I, I wanted to go back to Against the Loveless World, um, some parts from the beginning, and then I'll read a little bit from the end with the next question. Um, th this was just really moving to me in its description and the mother-daughter relationship as well. Um, so I'll go ahead. I listened, realizing I was hearing something from the silent depth of my mother. We were a family with secrets, things that lurked in the corners of our lives, unseen, unspoken but felt in the texture of arguments, the extra length of a pause, the focus of a stare. For example, I didn't know until many years later that I was probably conceived before my parents married. My father asked for mama's hand to avoid a scandal and shame. I don't know if the rumor was true, but it might have been the reason we barely knew her family. I met them when my maternal grandmother died in Syria and we traveled to their refugee camp in Yermuk for the funeral. Everyone was nice to me, my brother and mama, but I could tell from the warmth and love they exchanged with each other, but not with mama, that she had somehow always been on the margins of her family. She didn't say, but I thought it was because of me or because her father, who died when they were all kids, had loved her most. I need a cigarette, Habibti. Go inside, open the third drawer. In the very back, there's a pack rolled in socks. Mama was always between a pack a day habit and trying to quit periods. I was the only girl among my friends who wasn't trying to sneak a smoke at that age. I had read in the comic book how Western companies were using tobacco to kill us slowly and take all our money and resources in the process. Refusing to smoke was an act of rebellion and I liked to lecture others about the Western conspiracy but I didn't want to spoil the moment with mama. So I dutifully fetched her Marlboro stash as the tea boiled in the kitchen. May God bless you for all your days, my daughter, she said when I returned with the hot pot, two cups, a cut of fresh mint, sugar, and her stale pack of Marlboros. Normally we could see kids playing in the narrow street below our balcony, but it was laundry day and our clothes hanging to dry obstructed the view. As mama had taught me, I had hung my brother's jeans and shirts on the outer lines facing the street, then mama's dish dashes. My pants, dresses, and shirts were in the middle lines hidden from the lustful eyes of adolescent passerby. And finally, on the inner lines, close to the edge of the balcony, we hung our underwear. Instead of looking out at the goings on in the street, all we could see were our panties fluttering in the wind under a blue sky. Brilliant. That's so moving. Uh, I have to say that um, these novels are incredible. And um, the, the first time I actually got in touch with Susan was because my, my daughter started to, <laughs> to read at the age of 10, probably, Mornings in Janine. And I couldn't, basically, she re I started to read Mornings in Janine as soon as it appeared. And I was um, on a holiday. And I could, basically, I didn't participate in the holiday because I didn't want to leave reading the book. And so my daughter since then started to be so obsessed with wanting to read the book and I couldn't let her, I couldn't prevent her even she was possibly a bit too young to, to understand the depth and the, of, of the stories that are narrated. Um, and I think she 
you know, she was inspired by 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 Susan to um, to become um, to start writing herself. Um, I that, that means I, I, that, that that really means a lot. And thank, yeah. I mean, um, uh, and and wonderful for you to to encourage your your kid to read at such a young age. I mean, that you know, that's yeah, a good mom. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I needed to hear that today. I also think that uh, one of the most extraordinary aspects of your novels, uh, Susan, is that uh, they speak to so many different audiences and they can be read at so many different levels. And so um, whenever I want to suggest um, a book to read to someone who is not knowledgeable about a Palestinian conflict and not even interested I suggest read Susan Abul Hawa not to become acquainted to the Palestinian conflict, but to understand something about um, feminism, about humanity, about uh, life, about loss, about love. And um, and I have to say that all of those who I um, encourage to read your books who had no idea about Palestine still have no idea about Palestine, but they <laughs> thoroughly enjoyed and understood at least at, at the emotional level uh, this what, what's at stake there. I wanted to um, ask my last question, really, um, and um, which is a bit more political uh, about your sort of your political position, uh, because um, the way I read um, against a loveless word, um, which I agree, I mean, is with uh, Araf uh, Soif is 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 probably the most unapologetic and uncompromising of your of your uh, novels, in my view. Um, it's um, it's the book where you break taboos. You do break taboos in all of the others, but in here it it, it comes about in in the most um, powerful way. You talk about sex work, about rape, collaboration, betrayal, same sex relate same sex relations with with the enemy. <laughs> you desacralize the national res uh, resistance culture and the culture of martyrdom, where you have passages where you kind of. Um, Desacralizes still in an affectionate way, but there is um, an underlying critique. Um, and you even name the feelings of alienation um, towards the homeland, which, for example, uh, betrays Nahar when she goes back to Palestine. Uh, when she says, Palestine was my mother's word. It belonged to city was figure stories. Palestine didn't want me, nor I, um, nor I her any longer. I was again unfeathered and vulnerable, a stranger in a place that I had felt like home. So again, there is the theme of where is home, which returns uh, very powerfully in this novel. And yet, um, despite sort of this desacralizing and desacralized uh, portrayals, you still have a lot of sympathy and um, in, in, in the way you describe uh, and portray uh, the, the the creative resistance, for example, of Palestinians in 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 in, in the occupied Palestinian territories. When, uh, for example, Bilal and Nahar sabotage the water pipes with the aim of getting rid of the Israeli settlement nearby, which is an extraordinary. I don't know whether this is something that happened for for real or whether it's fantasies. <laughs> fantasy. Uh, I th I thought it was a great idea, by the way. <laughs> right, I hope it inspired. Yeah. Um, and yet, so my question to you, so there is both sort of a desacralizing narrative underlying the novel, but a huge um, sympathy and uh, attention to pay um, gratitude to the resistance that Palestine, ordinary Palestinian women and men have been carrying out since, um, since 1948, and uh, in the book in particular, it's the second intifada that features more prominently. So my question to you is, is whether this signal something that is more sort of close to a political critique towards um, the nationalist leadership that has failed us both in the resistance and in making Palestine home? So I think um, you know novels should be read um, as a novel, and and uh, um, uh, and the reader gets to make um, gets to make those uh, critiques and imbue it with the meaning that they find. Um, <clears throat> my my. Uh, aim 
is always, like I said earlier, um, was to tell the truth. And that's what I mean by loyalty to the characters. Um, and the truth is that, you know, we have collaborators among us. Um, not every, so, so for example, I'll give you a good example of what I'm talking about and the way that we ourselves um, fall into these um, Orientalist uh, narratives. And so when we, you know, when we see um, all these beautiful young Gazan men and women uh, go towards the fence, knowing that they're going to be shot in the great march of return. Um, very rarely does anybody actually, I mean, there, there, there's, all, there's all manner of fanfare around them. Um, and, uh, it, it, but very rarely does anybody explore their lives to explore who they are how they lived and and why they did that you know there there can be all kinds of reasons there can be you know um there can be the reason that everyone celebrates right it can be the reason that that you know this is the ultimate sacrifice for the homeland it's it, it's extraordinary bravery um and no matter what i mean it's it, it, you know bravery is um is an important element but also there is a, you know, the reality is that there's, there's an extraordinary lack of hope in Gaza. Um, we don't know what their motivations are. And I think we have to, we have, we owe it to them to know, you know, to know what, what, what took them there. Um, it's not, you know, I, I, I just, I resent this, this sort of constant romanticizing of our suffering. Right, there are serious mental health issues in Gaza after de after over a decade of this barbaric siege by Israel, by by a lack of opportunity, by all these beautiful young minds with so much potential going to waste and 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 literally having nowhere to go. When you start to contemplate the the despair that that creates for yourself, for your children, for your family, you know, then things start to, to make a little bit more sense. Um, and, and we owe it, like, so, so I guess my point is that I don't like romanticizing our suffering. I just don't like it. And, I, um, and I'm suspicious of people who do. I'm suspicious of people who have this constant um, romantic, uh, narrative about Samud, about us being these superheroes who can take anything about us. You know, we are human, we are vulnerable, we are fragile, we are hurt, we are traumatized. Um, we, are, we are wonderful, we are corrupt, we are all of those things. And I think it is a writer's job to be honest. Um, it is a writer's job to, um, to look very deeply into the interior world of the characters we want to present and 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 just to be honest that's you know and that's not always easy to do um because you know because sometimes people hate you for it um and and i you know and i'm not somebody with thick skin i'm i <laughs> especially when it comes to my people you know I'm very affected by criticism from my own people, but that doesn't mean that I wouldn't, that I would temper um, what I feel is true and what I feel is honest. Um, so, so I hope that all of those things, you know, uh, um, come across in the book. Uh, I was, you know, I, it did give me pause before this book was published and I was kind of holding my breath when it came out. Um, especially I was concerned that Arab women were going to hate me, you know, like, um, I know at least, you know, one very dear friend of mine who's a very prominent intellectual and I'm not going to name him. Um, and we're still friends, but he was very upset with me for writing a story about a, um, a woman who, who resorts to prostitution and re resorts to sex work. Um, and, you know, in his view, 
uh, it was, you know, we have so many extraordinary people in our society. Why would you focus on somebody like that? I'm not interested in extraordinary people. I, I mean, Nahid was extraordinary. She, I think she was extraordinary, but I'm not interested in the conventional kind of narrative of, of who gets romanticized. Um, I'm interested in the people who, that we as a marginalized society, the people that we push to the margins. Those are the people that I, whose lives I'm interested in. And I also, and, and so there was a reason that I, that, that Nahid became a, a, a freedom fighter, right? Because, you know, I wanted to take this person that our society thinks is disposable and put her in a position that is exalted. And what does that mean? How does society react? How do you move the center to the margins? Um, and that's what I wanted to do. And that's, um, uh, and it was, it, I mean, as a writer, I have to say it was deeply gratifying. Um, and in the end, you know, I have um, this bit of advice, this wonderful advice that I got very early on from, um, do, you, do you know who Ornette Coleman is? No. So Ornette Coleman is a, is a, um, he's a very famous jazz player. Um, he passed away <clears throat> a few years ago, um, but I had the great fortune of being in his loft um, uh, with some friends years ago and his son Donardo and I was I was a little bit anxious about my second book you know the blue between sky and water and I was just in the you know writing it um in the middle of writing it and he said listen um now Ornette Coleman even though now he's considered one of the greatest jazz musicians ever to, to have lived and when he first started playing he he upended jazz and he was booed off stage repeatedly and a lot of the great the the great jazz musicians of the of his time refused to play with him. Miles Davis, John Coltrane, they wouldn't. They thought he was ruining, just you know, making a mockery of jazz. And it took a while before somebody like really listened. Was like, wait a minute, this is a kind of genius what he's doing. It's a musical genius. And and then, um, and so what Donardo said to me was, you know, listen, all you need to do is make your art and 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 let it let it let it be good in your heart, you know, as, as long as you think you did right by your characters and your art, that's all you need. And he said, if my dad had listened to those people, he would have never continued. Um, and so that has always stayed in my mind. And so that's, I kind of live by that when I'm writing is that, okay, am I, do I feel good about this? And, 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 and is this honest? Yeah. And um, so that's, yeah. Thank you. Really brilliant. Is that? Do you think is that the reason why the book was uh, banned in Jordan? You know, Mornings in Janine was banned also in Jordan. <laughs> um, only the Arabic translation. Th weirdly, the English is allowed. So I think only people who read only in Arabic are not allowed to read it. I, um, I don't know why it's banned. I think the only thing I can think of is that you know when when Nahid goes to to Amman, she you know she really misses Kuwait. She grew up in Kuwait. She loves Kuwait. Um, she misses it, uh, even though she kind of grew to be very angry at Kuwaiti society, but she, you know, she loves that landscape, as I do, you know, uh, personally, because I was born there, and I, and I, um, anyway, um, but she, she says, you know, Amman is like the asshole of the Middle East, <laughs> I think that's what she, um, because, you know, she's, she's displaced, she's exiled, her life has been uprooted, there's no mall, and she was a very shallow kind of girl in, in Kuwait, and she loved shopping and, and makeup and things like that, and she goes to Amman, and there's no malls, and everything is dusty, and, um, and uh, uh, yeah, and so she, and then there, suddenly there's all these refugees in Amman, and so she said, you know, everybody probably, has... Probably, exactly, probably it's not about the, the transgressive nature of the characters, but it's naming a man yeah. of the I think, I think that's what it is they didn't want you know people to read that somebody thinks Amman is the asshole of the middle east <laughs> that's wonderful i don't well, know if i want to say i personally love Amman. i i think i think in urdun is a beautiful landscape absolutely i i agree with you <laughs> um Rafif, do you have a piece that you wanted to read on on this or shall we uh, or or anything actually you wanted to um 
Uh, no, I think we're getting on with time so we can take yes. people's questions and open yes. the conversation. But thank you for the very kind introduction, Ruba, and thank you, Susan, for a very great conversation. Rafif, thank you for those excellent readings um, and for your art and your brilliant poetry. And I'm so looking forward to you being at Palestine right soon. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I am um, just going to <clears throat> to read some of the questions that have appeared here in the Q and A. Um, this is um, the name is not uh, clear, but the surname is Tonsi. Um, thank you for organizing this panel. My question is: How do you manage to separate your writing from your own trauma and or your own experiences? How do you separate your academic and artistic careers? Thank you. I guess it's yeah. been a question to both, given yes. that. Um, yeah, yes. Yeah. Susan, Rafi, would you like to answer that? Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure why I have to separate um, the two. Um, it's, it, it would be strange to try to. And I, I know sometimes in academia, we're pushed to say, like, this is my academic hat um, and this is my artistic hat. And I, I work on very different things. Like when it comes to my academic writing, it's actually very heavy political economy on like ports and containers. Um, and my, my poetry is quite different, but the two seep into each other in very interesting ways. I think we're all multi-dimensional people. That's, that's more interesting. And, and the more you can do work that you really love, but have different parts of you seep into the other, I think it makes for better work. Um, the same goes for activism as well. Like quite often people said, if you want an academic career, you need to be quiet and not speak. Um, but I found actually that my activism strengthened um, what I write, but also my relationship with my students. So that's how I think of them, not as like these separate spheres. Thank you, Rafif. I, I agree completely with you, Rafif. And I, um, uh, I, it's very much a Western concept, really, this kind of delineation of uh, of our lives, um, which which doesn't make sense. And I often try and, you know, sort of analogize, like, how do, like, how would I separate the woman in me from the mother in me? There's, there's just, you know, they overlap in very profound ways. Um, I, you know, my academic life, if you want to call it that, is actually in science. My, my whole education is in, is in, um, the natural sciences and neuroscience. Um, and so, uh, you know, even that, even though I, I'm probably using a totally different part of my brain when I'm analyzing data and things like that, um, it still found its way in, in Mornings and Janine, for example, that, you know, when she comes to the US, uh, Emma, that's what she's doing. <laughs> you know, she's working for, um, she's doing medical writing for drug companies. But, um, uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that because I think you you expressed it so well, Rafif and I, and I wholeheartedly agree with you on that. I my my question would on this line would be would be to Susan, how do you reconcile your scientific writing <laughs> with your um, novels? <laughs> this is an extraordinary uh, aspect yeah. of yours that you can write in such different uh, contexts, uh, and I, I would be really curious to see how poetic they are. Your they're not, they're, they're, you know, you can, uh, you I'm sure you're, I'm sure. On, you can look some of them up on PubMed. They're not, well, they're, I'm sure you're changing the genre even there. Um, uh, so there is another question from an anonymous attendee to Susan. Can you talk a bit more about how you dealt with the changes in your identity in exile and how did this affect your work and how you resonate with these characters? Mm. Um, so I, I think I kind of hinted at this earlier um, that, you know, exile is, um, exile is a thief. It is a, um, a tormentor at times. Um, and, and it creeps up on you, uh, but it also gives you distance. Um, it gives you a new lens. Um, for which to see this collective trauma that we all stand in. Um, there, you know, the, the, the geographic uh, fragmentation of our society has resulted in this kind of um, 
psychological, linguistic fragmentation, psychological fra fragmentation, um, and even hierarchy of Palestinianness. And, um, you know, these are things that, uh, um, that I try to grapple with also in, in my literature and in, in what I write. Um, you know, all, so, so again, it's, it's all intertwined. Um, I can't separate my life experience entirely from my characters. Maybe some writers can, um, but because my, my characters move through a milieu that is very similar to, uh, to the, 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 the historic background that I've had to navigate, um, I inevitably end up putting uh, some of my own life experiences into, um, into their experiences. Uh, if for no other reason than the simple fact that I understand them, you know, I, it, you have to understand experiences, I think, on a visceral level. And those that you don't, I think, so for example, in Against the Loveless World, there are, um, uh, you know, she's imprisoned. And that was uh, a really heavy responsibility that I felt to portray that, having never been imprisoned myself. Um, and that's the reason why Nahed was in an entirely fictional kind of prison. Um, I didn't, I didn't dare try and attempt, attempt, try to describe a real prison or something um, that I had no right to, uh, 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 to, to try and depict. Um, but I, you know, it, it required a tremendous amount of research, um, conversations, and delving very deeply into one's imagination as well, um, which includes delving into one's own experiences, because again, we're, you know, we're multifaceted and all those facets are, 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 in, are, are cannot be delineated <laughs> from one another. Thank you, Susan. Uh, <clears throat> there is a question, I wanted to ask you actually another question myself, which um, um, I don't want to forget. Uh, which is, I mean, you are one of my favorite writers and the other are <laughs> or contemporary. Um, and I don't know whether it was my bias because I wanted, when I love someone and something, I tend to kind of see them in, 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 in other books that I'm reading and vice versa, but I couldn't help but seeing some in, sort of some influences or some uh, signs of, uh, and I, again, perhaps it's, it was in my own imagination, of authors such as Toni Morrison uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, authors such as Camila Shamsia, for example, especially in the way in which you, you write about love and compassion, and some of your female characters are so, could be easily perceived as Palestinian Antigones. Um, with their work of compassion and uh, which is so political uh, um, at the same time. Um, and to be honest with you, I couldn't help but seeing a little bit of Elena Ferrante in the way in which sort of the uncanny and the intimate portrayal of, 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 of the most intimate uh, aspects of your female characters' lives are so uh, poetically and masterfully really presented. In the books, and so I wanted to to know whether this was something that you also um, see, and and whether you are inspired by these uh, authors, or or which are the authors that have inspired you now and when you were growing up, I guess. Um, so, well, first of all, thank you. I mean, it's an honor to to even be sort of put in the same breath as Toni Morrison and um, uh, Kama the Shamsi, um, who's a friend of mine, and uh, uh, or, or um, Elena Ferrante as well. <laughs> Um, uh, yes, I mean, um, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to tell, like, if I was influenced by them or not. I, you know, I love their work. Um, I, I, you know, I've read a lot of Arabic uh, um, novels as well. Um, some of my favorite novels um, are include, you know, A Hundred Years of Solitude um, by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Um, 
the god of small of small things, um, Arundhati Roy, um, uh, Ibrahim Nasrallah's Time of the White Horses, um, and uh, Qanadin Malik Al Jalil. Um, I think it's translated into English as well. Um, I love the books of uh, Huzama Habayeb. Uh, um, Isabella Allende. Um, uh, I mean, and we have, yeah, so <laughs> it's yeah, hard. To tell. I mean, yeah, this, like, I, I like a lot of, yeah, a lot of books just kind of stick with me. But I mean, I would say actually, my, my probably all time favorite novel is 100 Years of Solitude for, for some reason that really resonated with me. But I want to say as a child, I actually didn't have books. Um, and when I came to the United States, I couldn't read or write English. Um, except maybe on like a third grade, I mean, a first grade level. Um, and uh, it was my big secret. I was in eighth grade and I, and I had to hide the fact that I couldn't read or write English. And, um, and I learned to become literate by copying the entire page of the front page of the Charlotte Observer newspaper. <laughs> I had no idea what I was writing, but it, at some point it started to make sense. And I finally, um, when I the, the first when I finally read a book um, from cover to cover, I was um, about fourteen years old, fourteen or fifteen years old. So I hadn't read really um, prior to that. I mean, I think I'm, I I must I had books, small books or something when I was younger, but I just don't remember reading. I remember craving books. I remember really wanting to have books um, and not having access to them. Um, and so that first book that I read cover to cover, there were two actually. Um, the first one was um, The Outsiders by S.E. Henton. Um, and then the other one was The Color Purple by um, Alice Walker. So, yeah. So I have one last question here uh, from the audience um, before maybe offering also Rafif the opportunity if she wants to ask something. <laughs> Uh, and um, the time to wrap up, uh, and I know Amina Yakin, who's one of the organizers of the festival, wants, wants to announce the next events, and I'm sure that Susan is also very tired, but uh, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go with the last question uh, from uh, R. Pat. Do both of you feel that you are different to the Palestinians who have lived and fought back in Palestine? Who wants to take that? You want to start this time around? <laughs> sure. Um, so again, this kind of goes back to um, you know this fragmentation of our society. Certainly, our experiences um, are different. Um, I mean, I you know, for whatever it's worth, I did live in Palestine under occupation, but although not my entire life. Um, but without a doubt, our experiences have been different. So we don't. I don't have to worry about somebody knocking my door down in the middle of the night and dragging my kid out in her pajamas and, and arresting me or her or, or demolishing our home or bombs falling on us. For sure, we don't have to face that. Um, but we also live in a, in a place, we are, as, as immigrants, as exiles, um, uh, that is disconnected from, from our families. Uh, there, is, there is a real sense of, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there's a real sense of um sorry we don't there's mind a real sense of aloneness <laughs> in exile a real sense of just disconnect go ahead Rafif. they're not gonna stop they, somebody's at the door um i guess i guess to, what i would say is of course, I feel different to Palestinians, whether they are in the West Bank or Gaza or inside Israel proper um, or those in exile, because we're not one monolithic um, grouping. We're, we're a people like any other people. It would be the same as someone asking, do you feel similar to someone who's British who grew up outside? Um, the the experience is, is, of course, different. Um, and I, I want to go against a little bit this idea of like an authentic Palestinian experience of occupation, or even that there's an authentic experience of fighting. Um, what does it mean to be fighting? So the majority of Palestinians are refugees. Uh, we are a displaced population. Uh, there's a lot of us in the Shatat. 
the exile is not just in the West. Um, there's refugee camps where there are now generations of refugees who have born into refugee camps. And there was assaults on the camps in Lebanon, which continue to this day. If you look at what happened in Nahr al-Barid, um, I've worked with Palestinian refugees who had to leave Syria, become refugees for a third time, Iraq, Palestinian refugees from Iraq. Um, and that's why I think the focus on the ongoing Nakba and how that first moment of ethnic cleansing is actually continuous um, and stays with us is, is really important. So I would, I would stand against this idea of putting Palestinians in a hierarchy of authenticity according to what form of occupation they suffer. Um, and, and of course we are different. And if we weren't different, and if anybody tries to say, no, we're all the same, I would find that extremely suspicious. Thank you, Rafiq. That was a brilliant answer. Um, I, um, there is really one last question, which I think is a really nice one, if you can take it. Otherwise we will, uh, are you very, are you able to take the last question? Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. fine. I have my tea here, and I, okay. I, I, it's, it's a, it's a real joy to be with with Palestinian women. Um, so, same for for us. Um, so this is a SAW Students Union, um, um, uh, which says thank you so much for such a beautiful discussion. I feel so empowered and happy to see three Palestinian women speak about art and life. Could you elaborate more about this third space that isn't Sumud pity or the terrorist violent people? And do you think it, it was intentional or was it your reality and experience that created that through your writing? Um, I don't think it's a third space. I, it's not, and again, this is um, kind of, uh, you can't sort of put a whole society into these little boxes. Um, it's, we are, we're a society like any other. Like if you, if you just substitute Palestinians um, in that sentence with any other group, right? It, it would seem absurd to say, okay, if you're not awful and you're not good, who are you then? What is your third space? It sounds absurd to, to apply that logic maybe to, uh, to, to, to Egyptians or to French uh, people or, or Germans and whatnot. Um, we are society, uh, an ancient society, with an extraordinarily rich and varied and diverse heritage, um, a heritage that was, uh, um, uh, that, that was dynamic, that changed over time, that changed um, linguistically, it changed culturally, it, it, it was an, it was an organic evolution of culture, of food and, and, uh, and rituals and religions and pilgrimages and conquests and, and all of that. Um, and it produced an extensive and varied society. So we, we exist as every society exists, uh, spanning the full spectrum of humanity um, with all kinds of thoughts and um, political orientations, sexual orientations, economic orientations. I mean, whatever, every, whatever you, whatever exists in any society exists in us. So we are, we are, we are not a dichotomy and, and we're not a, uh, what's the trichotomy? <laughs> Is that a word? Um, we're not, you know, we, we don't, we're not divided into three categories either. We're the full spectrum of humanity, like everybody else. Is that's what I'm trying to say, and that is what art communicates. That's what you know. Rafif's poems communicate. Um, that's what Randa Jarrar's books, Salim Haddad's books. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Malak Matar's art. I mean, you can find this huge spectrum of human beings and lived life experiences in and the art that we produce, which is why artistic expression is, um, is vital to our survival as a people. And I think on this really important uh, note, um, we should um, start wrapping up and thanking uh, Susan for a really wonderful conversation, wonderful um, reflections and um, for Rafif, to Rafif 
for uh, reading and performing some of the uh, beautiful writing of Susan and uh, for yeah being with us until so, so late. Um, and I would just uh, then um, offer you Amina. Amina, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. The floor. Thank you, Amina, also for hosting this event in the Festival of Ideas. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's the exit note, isn't it? Oh, my dogs, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all of you for such an amazing, inspiring conversation. I've been mesmerized listening to it and um, learning so much. Uh, without everybody who has contributed to this Festival of Ideas, it wouldn't be what it, it has been. So a uh, warm, heartfelt thanks to all of you. I just want to remind you tomorrow is the last day of the festival and it's been um, it's been pretty um, amazing and inspiring in terms of the contributions and we have our big debate. So I wanted to remind you to join in. It's an Oxford style debate and you will be asked, not you, the audience will be asked to register their position before and after the debate. We've had a whole week on decolonizing knowledge. This is um, a moment where we will be discussing the theme and we have four speakers, professors, Margot Okazava, Ray Yamil, uh, and Yamila Hussein Shanan, who will be for decolonizing with a special message from Professor Linda Tuheve Smith. And Dr. Kahinde Andrews and Dr. Brian Allen will be against decolonizing higher education. So we hope you will join us from three to five B, uh, British summer time. And from five to seven, we will be uh, screening the play Decolonizing, not just a buzzword with a panel discussion with Butcher Boulevard. You've you've read the campus novel, come and see the campus play. This is about decolonizing conversations at the university. Um, thank you so much. There's a lot more happening tomorrow. I won't go into all of it. So it starts, the program starts at 11, but those are the highlights for tomorrow. So please join in. And thank you so much to Susan, to Rafif, to Ruba, and the tech support team who've been absolutely brilliant. Thank you. And a very good evening. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. <laughs>